Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with another dive into Socrates. We'll be looking at Plato's Apology today, and we'll be getting a feel for who Socrates was. This was his last defense of himself. This is a recording of his last defense before he is sentenced to die. Spoiler alert. And so, we're going to see what he has to say for himself. And we're going to dive into and talk about whatever we feel like we need to talk about along the way. I apologize that it's got the white background. I know that can be a little bit hard on the eyes, but I don't get a choice in this. So, we will be talking about Plato. Let's recount what we talked about in the last one where Plato is a large man with a slightly upturned nose and bugging eyes, right? He is looks to be slightly balding, <clears throat> and he is recorded as being somewhat overbearing. He likes to, to make his point by asking questions. Like, he, he asks you to refine your viewpoint to the point where you can no longer sustain it. And so, that favors heavily into this defense, and it's, it's important to keep in mind that if he were alive today, he almost certainly would be on a medication. He would almost certainly be under the care of one of the ologists and they would be prescribing him some kind of a medication to chemically alter his brain. He had a tendency to not bathe. He would, he would forget the mundanities while focusing on the other things such as lecturing or whatever. So he would almost certainly be treated today. But if he were treated so, he would probably not be able to do these things. So this is Plato's apology. He has been accused of corrupting the youth of Athens. Now, his corruption includes making people question the gods. Not even necessarily be unpious, but to question the validity of the histories that have been passed down. <clears throat> Sorry. How you men of Athens have been affected by my accusers, I do not know. As for me, they spoke so persuasively that they almost made me forget myself. And yet they have hardly spoken one word of truth. But of the many lies they told, there was one that amazed me more than any. When they said that you must be on your guard lest you be deceived by me. Because I am a formidable speaker. The fact that they are not ashamed of being immediately refuted by me once I actually show myself to be no formidable speaker at all. This I thought utterly disgraceful of them. Once I actually, wait, unless they are calling the person who speaks the truth a formidable speaker. For if that is what they mean, I would accept that I am an orator, but not after their fashion. These men, as I say, have said little or nothing that is true, but from me you shall hear the complete truth, without ornate speeches, beautifully adorned, in every word and phrase, like the ones you hear from my accusers. No, men of Athens, by Zeus you shall hear me say whatever occurs to me to say, in a random manner, and none of you should expect anything else, since I am convinced of the justice of what I am saying. For it certainly would not be appropriate at my age to appear before you, men of Athens, with contrived arguments like some juvenile orator. What is more, men of Athens, I ask this of you. Indeed, I implore you, neither be surprised nor to cause a commotion if you hear me defending myself using the same arguments I am also accused and accustomed to using at the tables in the Agora where so many of you heard me, and elsewhere too, for the fact of the matter is that I am appearing before the court now, for the first time, at 70 years of age. So the language of the place is simply foreign to me. Now, if in fact I happen to be a foreigner, you would have surely forgiven me if I spoke in my own dialect, in the way I had been brought up to speak. And so, I am now making a request of you. A just request in my view that, for better or worse, you accept my manner of speaking and consider and apply your minds to this alone. If what I am saying is just or not. For this is the very excellence of a judge, while the excellence of an orator is to speak the truth. Now, 
It is only right that I first defend myself, men of Athens, against the first false accusations laid against me and my first accusers, and then deal with the later ones and the later accusers. For many of my accusers came to you a long time ago, many years ago, speaking not a word of truth. And I am more afraid of these accusers than of any Anitus and his associates, though they too are formidable. But these are more formidable people who got control of the most of you, gentlemen, in your childhood, gaining your trust and making accusations against me with no regard for the truth. That there, that there is this Socrates, a wise man who is preoccupied with the heavens above, has investigated everything beneath the earth, and who makes the weaker argument stronger. All right, we're going to pause here for a second. We're going to talk about this because this is very much relevant to today. It was when I got to this point that I was like, you know what? We're going to do a series on this because, first off, I have neglected my education. I have neglected my knowledge, and I like to share knowledge. So as I educate myself, I'm going to help to educate you. We're going to go through this and talk about it. But I try very desperately these days not to be too political on this channel because I like to have reach. I like people to see the knowledge and to be able to go with that and to to not be divided by what I say. I endeavor very much not these days to say very much political. <clears throat> but and that the saying goes, you can disregard everything before but, right? The speaking not a word of truth and the accusations, right? That's a big deal because this whole childhood grasping right here. They got control of you, of most of you gentlemen in childhood. Gaining your trust and making accusations against me with no regard for the truth. That there is this, Socrates, a wise man who is preoccupied with the heavens above, has investigated everything beneath the earth, and who makes the weaker argument stronger. There is indeed a battle against these things now, using the same methods now. We had a president not so very long ago who said that if you gave him your children, that he would have them and he would train them and they wouldn't have to worry. And we are reaping the benefits of that now. What is happening in our current society is directly related to that president and exactly what he said he was going to do, he did. And we are reaping the consequences of that. Now, I took my responsibility as a parent very seriously, and so my children are extraordinarily or educated in that. They go above and beyond the education that was given to them in their school. We have talked extensively about civics and rights and responsibilities and all of the things that they should learn in school but don't. It is directly a plot to suborn your children and to keep from them true knowledge of anything through the use of emotion and false knowledge they have control of your children that is a truth that that truth is why i'm doing this study because what happens then will happen again and it is in the current process of happening and so as so went socrates so goes our republic the people men of athens who put this story about or some are my most formidable accusers since those who tend to hear so since those who hear this tend to believe that whoever investigates such matters does not believe in the gods either. What is more, these accusers are numerous, and they have been making their accusations for a long time now. Indeed, 
They were speaking to you at an age when you were most easily convinced. Some of you were just children or youth, making unanswered accusations to which no defense was offered. But what is most unreasonable of all of it is that it's not even possible to be sure of their names and state them, unless one of them happens to be a certain comic poet. We talked about that yesterday. Yet, those who convinced you by recourse to malice and slander, or those who convinced others, too, when they themselves have been convinced. All those people present a formidable challenge. Those who convinced you by recourse to malice and slander, or who convinced others, too, when they themselves had been convinced. It's impossible to bring them here to cross-examine any of them, so I must simply fight with shadows in my own defense and conduct a cross-examination to which no one responds. <clears throat> this is the summation of my, well, in part, this is the summation of the axiom that I use all the time. Arguing with willfully ignorant uh, is like pissing in the wind. You get it out there, but you only wind up pissing. Because if you're arguing with someone who refuses facts or acts off of uh, simply emotion, it does no good to argue with them. And in the current day, they are the faceless numerous, numbers, num numbers, the numerous faces hidden across the internet. They are the number trolls with no profile pick. They are the ones out there talking mad game with nothing to back it up. They have no facts, and if you present facts, you get blocked. They don't argue from logic. They argue from emotion, from stirring up hate and division in such a manner that it fuels everything that they desire. It is the same nameless, faceless people with false accusations that Socrates was dealing with to scale to us now. So, and so you really should accept, as I say, that there have been two groups of accusers. Those who accused me recently and the earlier ones to whom I am now describing. And please, agree that I must defend myself against these first four. They were the first accusers you heard. And you heard them for a longer than my recent accusers. So be it. I must make a defense then, men of Athens. An attempt in such a short time to undo the slander you have picked up over so many years. Now... This is the outcome I would prefer if it were somehow better for you and for me. And I would like to succeed in my defense, but I think this is difficult and the sort of task it has not been entirely escaped my notice. In any case, this should unfold in whatever way God pleases. Yet, the law must be obeyed, so I must present a defense. He doesn't want to have to defend himself. But, since he must, he asks that they, they accept his level of defense. He, he has to defend himself against the nameless ones. As futile as that is, he has to do it and get it on record. And we are better for it than he did. That's some good water. When, in fact... Is the allegation that has been given rise to this slander against me? Presumably, the one Miletus relied upon when he brought the charge against me. Let us take up this question from the beginning. Well, when the slanderers slandered me, what did they say? Well, I should read out their charges if they were the accusers. Socrates acts unjustly and is excessively curious, investigating things beneath the earth and in the heavens, making the weaker arguments stronger, and teaching these same things to others. It goes something like that. And indeed, you yourselves have seen a Socrates in Aristophanes' comedy being carried about the place, claiming to walk on air and blabbering a lot of other nonsense about which I have no knowledge, great or small. 
and I am not speaking out of disrespect for this sort of knowledge if anyone is wise in such matters. I hope that Miletus' charges are never so numerous as to make me do that. But the fact is, men of Athens, I have no involvement with these matters. And I am calling you, the majority of you, as witnesses, and I think those of you who have heard either <clears throat> who have ever heard me engaging in discourse, as so many of you have, should instruct one another and inform one another. Yes, you should tell one another if any one of you have ever heard me discoursing on such matters to any extent, great or small. And from this you will realize that the other things that most people say about me are just like these accusations. So, what he is saying here is that he has never taught on any of these things. And the fact of the matter is, is that he doesn't teach in the traditional matter. We'll see that here shortly. But the way that he questions is what brings about, right? He is one of the, well, the best teacher because he inspires all the best teachers through the method that he uses. And the the question-answer dialogue between teacher and student is the best way to learn. Knowledge earned is knowledge learned. Knowledge taught is knowledge lost. And so making you earn it through asking about it is how you teach it. But by doing so, he never taught anyone anything. He was never someone to expound upon what the things were. He narrowed it down. Now what Plato does in in the dialogues that he has, is show that. In fact, not one of them is true. And if you've heard from anyone that I undertake to educate people and charge money for doing so, that is not true either. Although I would regard this too as a fine accomplishment if someone were able to educate people at, as Georges of Leonontini does. Prodicius of Seos too, and Hippias of Elis. For gentlemen, each of these men has the ability to go to any city, to the young people who are allowed con consort free of charge with their own fellow citizens as they please, and persuade the young to abandon the company of their own people, consort with them, pay their fees, and feel grateful besides. And I have become aware that there is also another wise man, a, a Parian, who lives here in town, for I happened to visit a man who has spent more money on sophists than on everyone put together. Callias, the son of Hipponicus. So I asked him about his two sons. Callias, said I, if, if your two sons happened to be colts or calves, we would be able to acquire an overseer for them and pay someone likely to make them noble and good in their appropriate excellence. And that person would be a, a horse trainer or a farmer. But now, since they are two human beings, whom do you intend to acquire as their overseer? Who is there who is knowledgeable in excellence of this kind, human and civic excellence? For I presume you have considered this since you have two sons. If Is there such a person or is there not? There certainly is, he replied. Who is it? I asked him. Where is he from and how much does he charge to teach us? He is a Venus, a Parian, he replied, and he charges five mina. And I would congratulate a Venus if he were truly to possess this skill and teach it for such a modest fee. I, for my part, would have been proud and given myself airs if I had this knowledge, but the fact is, men of Athens, I do not have this knowledge. One of the accusations is that he's taken, char taken money for the chart for, to, for teaching. <clears throat> Which is weird because it does not appear to be against the law. Right? Other people are doing it. Now, maybe they object to him because of his beliefs, and that's probably what it is. But in the Republic, shouldn't there be equal equal application of the law to the citizenry? Mm -hmm. Citizenry? That was difficult. <laughs> but he says he doesn't charge. Now, there is an account where someone else says that he does charge, but that is the someone who did not understand what he was talking about. So, who knows? Oh, I don't know, and to me, it really doesn't matter. If he was 
if Plato's account is accurate, even just just the early accounts, if if just that is accurate and he was charging for his knowledge, then he would have been well justified to do so. Now, one of you may perhaps object, but Socrates, what is it that you do? What is the origin of these slanders against you? Yes, surely this rumor and talk would not have arisen unless by your conduct you stood out from everyone else, unless you were behaving differently from most people. So tell us what it is, so that we do not make rash judgments about you. I think that whoever says this is raising some fair questions, and I will try to show you exactly what it is that has given rise to this reputation of mine, and, and the slander too. Listen then, and some of you will probably think that I am joking, but mark my words. I shall tell you the whole truth. For I have acquired this reputation, men of Athens, but only because of a particular kind of wisdom. What kind of wisdom is this? The particular wisdom that is perhaps human wisdom. In fact, I probably am wise in that wisdom. And perhaps those men whom I mentioned earlier may be wise with a wisdom that is greater than human wisdom. Otherwise, I do not know what to say. For I myself have no knowledge of it, and anyone who says so is lying and is out to slander me. And I do not, and do not raise a glamour against me, O men of Athens, even if you think I am speaking boastfully. In fact, the word I shall speak is not my own, rather, I shall refer to a trustworthy speaker. For I shall provide you with the God of Delphi as witness of my wisdom, if indeed it is wisdom. Of the sort of wisdom it is. Indeed, I presume you knew Chaperon. He was my friend from my youngest years and a friend of your democracy, too. And he joined you in your recent exile and returned along with you. Well, you also know what Chaperon was like and how impulsive he was in anything he took on. And in fact, he once went to Delphi and dared to consult the, arch the oracle about this. And as I said, please do not raise a clamor, gentlemen. Yes, he asked if anyone was wiser than me. So the Pythia answered that no one was wiser, and his brother, who is here, will be your witness of this, since the man himself is dead. That's some, that's a, that's, a, that's fun. Like, that's some fun stuff right there. That's the equivalent of going to a Catholic in 1000 AD and saying the Pope told me it, like that's what it is that, that's the equivalent of going to well we'll leave that out of it but it's the equivalent of going to the source right because to them Delphi was a god and if the god answered through the prophet that no one was wiser that's that's significant and the fact that he didn't ask that, but someone that they knew had asked that, and there was a witness to that. That's, that's golden. Now, consider my reasons for saying all this. <clears throat> for I am going, out, going to set out for you the origin of the slander against me. Indeed, when I heard this, I reflected upon it as follows. What exactly does the God mean? And what on earth is the riddle he poses? For I myself am aware of being wise in nothing, great or small. So what precisely does he mean when he says that I am the wisest? Of course he cannot be lying, since that is not lawful for him. And I was perplexed for a considerable time as to what precisely he meant. And then, with much reluctance, I turned to a process of inquiry that went something like this. I went to one of the people who seemed to be wise on the assumption that there, if anywhere, I could refute the oracular utterance to show the oracle. This person is wiser than me, but you said I was the wisest. Now, I need not name the man, but it was one of our politicians I was examining. And in my experience, men of Athens was somewhat as follows. As I engaged him in discourse, it seemed to me that Although this man was thought wise by many other people, and most of all by himself, he was not wise. 
And so I attempted to throw, to show him that although he believed himself to be wise, he was not wise. As a result, I was hated by him and by many of those present. I reckoned as good as I was going that I was, I reckoned as I was going that I was as am wiser than this man. For it is likely that neither of us knows anything noble and good. But he thinks he knows something when he does not know, while I do not actually know. I do not even think that I know. So perhaps in this one minor respect, I am wiser than he is, because I do not think I know what I do not know. I then went to someone else, to one of the people who seemed wiser than that man, and I came to the very same conclusion. And in this case, I too was hated by him and by many others. Now, after this, I kept on going, aware that I was hated, grieving and fearful, but it seemed necessary nevertheless to set the work of the God above all else. In considering the meaning of the oracle, I had to go get all of those who seemed to know something. And by the dog, men of Athens, for I must speak the truth to you, my experience was something like this. When it came to understanding, those with the most exalted reputations seemed to me, as I searched at the God's behest, well nigh worse off, while other men of lower repute were better off. And so I must recount my wanderings to you uh, and the labors I undertook, only to find the oracle irrefutable. For, after the politicians, I went to the poets and the tragedians, the Dethenbriest and the rest, expect expecting, in this case, to show myself up, blatantly, as being more ignorant than they. So, selecting poems of theirs that, in my opinion, they had crafted most intricately, I would question them as to what they meant and in order to learn something from them in the process. Now, gentlemen, I am ashamed to recount to you, recount the truth to you, but it must be spoken nonetheless. For in a sense, almost anyone who was present might have spoken better than the poets about the poems they themselves had composed. And so, in the case of the poets too, I quickly realized that it is not by wisdom that they compose their works but by nature, and by being inspired, just like the prophets and deliverers of oracles. For these people also say a great deal, and it is beautiful too, but they know nothing about what they are saying. <laughs> it was evident to me that the poets were in a similar predicament, because I became aware at the same time that because of their poetry, they also thought themselves the wisest men in general, when they were not. And so I left their company too, thinking I was better off than they are, in the same way that I was better off than the politicians. And then finally I came to the craftsmen, for I myself was aware that I really had no knowledge, and yet I knew that I would find that their knowledge was extensive and beautiful. Well, <laughs> I was not deceived in this. They did know things I did not know, and in this respect they were wiser than me. But Men of Athens, it seems to me that the preeminent craftsmen also had the same failing as the poets. Because they exercised their skill so beautifully, they deemed themselves extremely wise in other matters too. Matters of great importance. And this error of theirs obscured that wisdom. And so I asked myself on behalf of the oracle whether I should accept my present condition neither wise in any of their wisdom, nor foolish in any of their folly, or possess in their wisdom and their folly. And so I responded to myself and the oracle that it was better for me to remain as I was. Here we have another significant correlation to current times. First, he goes... And he looks at the poets, right? <clears throat> right, that wasn't first. First he went to the wise men, right? And all of them were not quite wise. The way he does that is, we'll see in a little bit, but he asked them questions about the things that they state and asked them to refine their point. And it gets to the point where 
they don't really comprehend the thing that they are talking about. They are merely repeating what they have learned. And so that is how he proves that they are unwise, right? At least in the things that they claim wisdom in. And his wisdom lies in knowing that he does not know the things that he does not know, right? It is good to be firm in the things that you do know to the measure that you do know them. There can be something that you are fully educated currently in that has something that breaks through and is completely changing of the fundamentals of that. Regardless of how long ago you learned it or how long ago it became available to be learned. The wisdom that he breaks there is you need to, in order to claim understanding, be able to understand how something works. Right? So if if I were to claim, for instance, that climate change was caused by the sun instead of carbon, I would have to be able to back that up by a understanding of the electromagnetic harmonics of the universe and the transversal of space and the variation that can come from that, as well as the knowledge that carbon is a plant food and it causes exponential growth. And the more that you have, the better it actually is for the planet. All of these things are, can be proven and can be backed up, but in order for me to make the claim that I know it, I have to understand it. I can't just say, I heard Ben Davidson say it and I heard the Thunderbolts Project say it. That's why I do the individual research. I do not understand it to the point where I am comfortable teaching it at all, and I am clear with that at all times. It is my current understanding but I do not ever mean to imply that it can be the only understanding. And then he went to the poets, and the poets are those who entertain us. They are the screenwriters of today. And they did not even understand <clears throat> the things they wrote. They did not comprehend the things that they put down onto paper. And there is, there is a bit of correlation with today. If you're familiar with this channel at all, you know that I have, for a decade or so, done away with pretty much all forms of entertainment that are not educational to myself. And it's because of that in particular. And then he goes to the craftsmen, which is the three major divisions in society, right? You have the people who know, you have the people who entertain, and you have the people who do. And so he goes to the people who do, and he finds that they do indeed have some wisdom. They, at least, understand their craft. That's important, right? You should understand your craft at a fundamental level if you ever expect to be a master of it. And so, it is good that they know that. But because they know that, they think that they can expound upon other things. And again, we have a correlation because... We have an awful lot of people on this planet, and we have a good deal of entertainers. And for the purposes of this, we're going to call entertainers craftsmen because they are masters of their craft. By the time they make it to our screen, they have perfected their craft of delivering to us entertainment. But because they, they have delivered entertainment to us and they are masters at that, they also feel the need to let everyone know what their political beliefs are. Despite almost every instance, and it's never always every instance, but almost every instance, they really have no concept or clue of what they're talking about. They don't understand on a fundamental level the workings of the thing they're speaking of. That is exactly what Socrates is talking about. From this process of investigation, men of Athens, I have incurred a great deal of hatred from the most troublesome and grievous kind, from which many slanders have arisen. And I am called wise for those who are present or always assume I am wise in those matters in which I refute someone else. But in fact, gentlemen, it is more likely that the God is actually wise, and through this oracle he is saying this. 
that human wisdom is of little or indeed no value. And he appears to be referring to me, Socrates. And what is more, he is using my name, using me as an example. As if he were to say, he among you, O humans, is wisest, who recognizes, like Socrates, that he is in truth worth nothing when it comes to wisdom. Understanding that you lack knowledge is the beginning of gaining knowledge. You will never attain all knowledge. It is an impossibility even on a single subject. Always keep yourself open to the greatest degree possible to correction of your thoughts. Do not self-deceive yourself into believing that you understand fully anything, including yourself. And so to this very day, I go about conducting these investigations, seeking out at the God's behest anyone, either citizen or stranger, whom I think to be wise. And once he seems not so to me, to assist the God I know, I show that he is not wise. And because of this occupation, I have no time for any involvement in civic affairs worth mentioning. Or for any private concerns either. For I am in utter poverty because of my servitude to the God. In another place, at another time, he would have been labeled a prophet. For, for all of the conditions and by which he lives, by the way. As well as this, the young people follow me of their, about of their own accord, those with the most free time who belong to the wealthiest families. They enjoy hearing people being examined, and they are often imitate me themselves when in turn they attempt to examine others. And then they fi then find, I am sure, a whole host of people who think they know something, when they know little or nothing. So, as a result, those whom they cross-examine get angry with me rather with themselves. And they say that Socrates is a pestilence who corrupts the young. And whenever anyone asks them what I do and what I teach, they have nothing to say. They have no idea. And so, and so that they do not seem to be at a loss, they repeat the convenient charges made against all philosophers that they investigate the heavens above and the earth below and that they do not believe in the gods and that they make the weaker arguments stronger. For, in my view, they are reluctant to speak the truth and admit that they are being exposed, pretending to know when they know nothing. Now, because, as I see it, these influential people are ambitious forceful and numerous, and because they speak to me about me assertively and persuasively. They have assailed your ears over many years with their comprehensive slanders. On this basis, Miletus has proceeded against me, and an Aeneatus and Lycon. Miletus being angry on the poet's behalf, Aeneatus on behalf of the craftsmen and politicians, Lycon on behalf of the rhet rhetoricians. <clears throat> and so, like I said at the outset, I would be surprised if I were able, in the short time available, to rid you of this slander when it has become so pervasive. There, you have the truth, men of Athens. I have concealed nothing significant or insignificant. I am speaking without restraint, and yet I know quite well that these are the very reasons I am hated, which proves that I am speaking the truth. That's this is the slander against me, and these are its causes. And if you investigate these matters, either now or in the future, you shall find it so. Now, this defense that I offer you against the accusations made by my first accusers should be sufficient. I shall attempt to follow this with a defense against Miletus, that good man and friend of the city, so he proclaims, and the later accusers too. Well then, we should take their affidavit in turn, and if they were, as if they were a different set of accusers, it goes somewhat as follows. 
it says that so Socrates acts unjustly by corrupting the young and believing not in the gods the city believes in, but in other novel divine forces. That is the sort of chain charge that it is. We shall and we should scrutinize every detail of this charge. Well then, the charge states that I am acting unjustly by corrupting the young, and yet I state, men of Athens, that Miletus is acting unjustly, because he is making a joke of a serious matter by blithely bringing people to trial, pretending to be serious and concerned about matters that he has never cared about at all. But I shall also attempt to demonstrate to you that this is the case. And so that is where we're going to take the break for this one. This is getting kind of long, and uh, it's better to do it in chunks. This next section breaks apart pretty easily into a new section. It is him and Miletus actually talking back and forth. And so uh, this is a good natural place to stop. Hopefully, I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a fairly straightforward topic, right? We are just reading through, which seems to be something that we're going to do over here. We will talk about things as they pop up, as we did. Hopefully, if you're still here, that you enjoyed what I did. And if you did enjoy this and you would like to see more content like this, then show me the love. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment. Let me know you appreciate what we're doing over here because it's I'm going to do it regardless, but it's nice to get the reinforcement, the, the positive reinforcement, and to get that algorithm cooking once again. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt State. Peace.